Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is our 20th time to conduct the Middle Author webinar. And today uh, we have pleasure to invite Professor Robert Wilson and also Professor He Lianzhen, the Vice President uh, of Zhejiang University, and also Professor Ben Shen Lin, the Dean of our uh, business school, as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang Zizhou and also Ms. Uh, Helen Zhang. Thank you very much for all of your participation uh, and also lots of audience uh, join us online and offline, really appreciate. So first of all, uh, may I invite Professor He Lianzhen to give us uh, the opening remark and to welcome uh, Professor Robert as well. So Professor He. Thank you, Professor Chen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending mm. on where you are joining us today. My name is He Lianzhen, Vice President of Zhejiang University. I want to welcome all of you to meet the author webinar series organized by International Business School, Zhejiang University. First of all, it's our great pleasure and honor to invite Professor Robert Wilson. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. And it's great to have you with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, glad to be here. I want to take this opportunity to con congratulate Professor Wilson and his colleague, Professor Paul Wilworm for their remarkable achievements in economics, which have been recognized by the Nobel Committee in 2020. Professor Wilson was the first to create a framework for auctions of items with a common value. In fact, Professor Milgram began to develop his theories as a doctoral student of Professor Wilson. Most notably, prior Nobel laureates, Bernd Holstrom and Elvin Roth were also doctoral students of Professor Wilson. The insights of Professor Wilson and Milgram into bidding and pricing has become integral to our modern economy. They've applied their discoveries to real world market problems, designing new and better auction formats for complex situations, including in industries like oil, chemical, and power. They pioneered the situations, the auction design for governments to allocate radio frequency, which has been adopted in countries around the world. Their accomplishments are a shining example of the ways in which fundamental discovery and its application to fund finding a real world situation can make enormous contributions to modern society. I'm inspired by their work and we are all deeply grateful for their contributions. Thank you. As the COVID-19 coronavirus continues to spread around the world, universities around the globe are shifting to digital knowledge dissemination in an effort to keep the world connected to each other. Zhejiang University, founded in 1897, is one of China's leading higher education institutions. In the last few months, we have been de dedicating ourselves to building a platform for knowledge dissemination to produce timely and a high impact outcome during the time of crisis. So I'm very glad to know Professor Wilson is willing to join us to support the initiative for knowledge dissemination. Me, the author webinar series is part of the initiative at Zhejiang University to cope with challenges during the pandemic and more importantly, to contribute to the whole world. In the last few months, we have had the pleasure to gather the inspiring speakers working on a wide range of areas and they are from London Business School, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Wharton Business School, the World Bank, and the Columbia Law School. I know today Professor Ben Shenling, Dean and Professor at International Business School, Zhejiang University, Chen Hongyi, Academic Director for Master of Finance, and Zhang Zizhou would join the interview and discussion session with Professor Robert Wilson in the next 60 minutes. I'm very excited about the session and all the best for today's event. With that, on behalf of Zhejiang University, 
I want to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Robert Wilson and Joe Ackland's team at Stanford University. Hope we will have the honor and the opportunity to host you and your team at Zhejiang University in the near future. Of course, members of Zhejiang University are also keen to visit you in Stanford as well. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor He Lianzhen, for your opening remark. I uh, really appreciate for your support to the webinar. So with that, um, I will uh, turn to uh, the interview session with uh, Professor Robert Wilson. So uh, Professor Robert Wilson, thank you very much for joining us today. I know it's almost the dinner time, so uh, we really want to express our gratitude for your participation. And also, I want to also take this opportunity to thanks to uh, Helen Zhang, uh, his colleague as well. So uh, first of all, Professor Robert Wilson, uh, we know that um, that the oxygen theory and also the excited achievement that you and your colleague have been done uh, for uh, the economic and also the theory. So in the very beginning of today's discussion, we would like to uh, get some of like uh, your, your thoughts uh, about uh, the background and uh, some of the definition. So the first question uh, for you is what made you interest in economy and uh, start doing research on auction theory? Well, my interest in economics actually came from my interest in auctions that occurred first. So I had worked with oil companies on um, bidding for leases for exploration rights. So that's what got me interested in auctions because that was the means by which the Department of Interior in the United States auctioned those rights, the, the contracts that allow exploration. So I saw how the auctions work, but I also saw that the bidders were quite uninformed about how to design a good bidding strategy and uh, what were some of the consequences of, of having strategies that were not optimal and, that, and it, what kinds of out outcomes it produced. So that was the beginning. And I also, uh, after early work on, the, on offshore bidding as a, as a scholar, as an academic, I got involved consulting with the Department of Interior on how it designed the auctions. So it came, my interest in auctions comes from this very practical point of view. It's not a theoretical concept, it was a very practical aspect. Right, right. Thank you very much for that. And I think that is very important and uh, to see how you apply the theoretical concept to the reality. And I think that is uh, very valuable. So thank you very much for that. So uh, we know about a bit about auction theory, but I think uh, it will be really great uh, for you uh, to help us to understand uh, what is really like the auction theory and what kind of like theory or the concept are considered to be relevant for analysis. Well, of course, there are millions of different kinds of auctions. They can be organized many different ways. When we think of what an auction is, it's really a platform for trading. Uh, nowadays, we see on the internet, you'll see trading platforms, uh, like for financial securities, for example. Uh, but in the, you know, 5,000 years ago, auctions were also used. They were used for uh, commercial transactions. And um, so there's a long history. There are the simple forms of our auctions that we're familiar with in which uh, say just a bidder submits a bid, the high bidder wins the object or, or the low bidder succeeds in selling the, you know, in acquiring the, selling the object. The, um, but there are different rules. I mean, you could be that the high bidder wins and pays the second high price, if not his own price. There can be multiple commodities. There could be multiple units of a given commodity and um, the informational, uh, the information provided during the auction could be varied by the auctioneer so that they, it could be that participants 
are able to follow the actual bids and they note, notice when other bidders drop out so they could learn during the process. In fact, some auctions are static, that is they don't have any time dimension and others are you know, dynamic. They go on over time with a, a whole learning process uh, embedded in it. Um, in the financial markets, uh, so, you know, since your program's uh, master's in finance, it's particularly relevant to think about the uh, financial markets because primarily these are double auctions. They're one in which there are uh, people offering, uh, uh, offering to sell and they have, po ask, they have asked prices or offering to buy and they have bid prices. And then we're looking for an equilibrium where supply equals demand at those at a single price, or in some cases they have discriminatory pricing. So the, um, I mean, nowadays we have such fancy kinds of auctions that they can't be described in an entirely simple way. But I, I guess I'm just emphasizing that there's an enormous variety and it's the person who runs the auction can design the various features that contribute to uh, the better outcome they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilson. So uh, we know both you and uh, uh, Milgren have invented a number of variable new uh, auction format and the design. So the most famous example is the simultaneous multiple uh, run auction, uh, which is developed for the 1994 US Federal Communication Commission. So uh, what is a simultaneous multiple run auction and how your approach differ from the traditional format? Okay, well, it was, um, it's an unusual circumstance that there were for that auction, a hundred different licenses being offered simultaneously. And these auctions, uh, these licenses covered different regions of the United States. So that say in, there was one for Southern California and one for Northern California and one for Hawaii and one for Oregon and so on. So uh, the bidders were trying to assemble a package of licenses so that they could have a coherent business plan. So it's very important if you're trying to serve California with a cell phone service, if you're going to get Southern California, you should really get try to get Northern California and the adjoining states. So the bidders were uh, very much interested in assembling packages of licenses that would enable uh, the most efficient business plan. But to do that, uh, we could have them bid directly for such packages, but of course, with 100 licenses, how many packages are there? I mean, there's like trillions and trillions. It would be very difficult to evaluate uh, what kind of uh, uh, bids that they would be best for them to make and how to evaluate the bids that were submitted. So we worked at it, uh, designed it in a way that took account uh, of two things. One is that for each license, each item in the auction, it should be a dynamic process so that bidders can learn during the auction from what from other bidders behavior because you see um, it was quite uncertain then and it always remains now that what the value of the spectrum will be is uncertain to all the bidders and they all have different estimates so it becomes uh, we have a winner's curse phenomenon if uh, that you win the item, but by having paid too much, if you base it entirely on your own estimate, you really should be taking account of the fact that other bidders have dropped out. In order for you to win, other bidders dropped out, it means they must have had lower estimates. So we should have a learning process for that, but also we should do it simultaneously so that all the prices you know, should be rising together so that, uh, during that process, bidders can choose at each configuration of prices, which is the most desirable uh, package of license, the best portfolio of licenses for them. And at the very end, of course, the bidder should be in a position to choose at those final prices, the its optimal portfolio. So this is very nearly a price-taking behavior. 
It's very nearly uh, perfect competition. It's very nearly perfectly efficient if it all works well, but there are very practical desi uh, design considerations. Like we had to have a, an activity rule, it's called. The bidders have to show their interest in the licenses they eventually acquire all through the process. So they have to keep actively bidding because otherwise a bidder might have a tendency to uh, what we, we call, <laughs> we used to call it a snake in the grass strategy. I mean, it's sort of hiding. So the famous one was that AT&T was particularly desirous of not showing which licenses it wanted to bid for. And so it was very secretive. And during the first phase of the auction, it, may, it submitted absolutely minimal bids on minimal properties without showing which, where its interests were. So we had to have this things like activity rules. But the point is that there were many aspects to design. You have to design that for the main feature that they're simultaneous multiple round auctions, but also that you should have something like an activity rule that all of these auctions close simultaneously. None, none of them close until they all close. That's so that we're assured of uh, better efficiency properties. So these are all design elements and that was the focus of our work. Right, right. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson, uh, to help us understand uh, the idea and the very clear uh, for the concept. So uh, do you see any difference in terms of auction format across the country, if any? For example, uh, what is the best, best auction format for radio spectrum auction? Particularly nowadays, 5G is getting popular. Oh, do you think it depends on the country? Well, certainly it depends on the sort of the size of the country in the sense that the smaller countries usually have a national licenses. So it's not a case like we had with the, like I described with, with California, we had multiple licenses for Southern California, Northern California and Oregon and so on. So usually if you're say in Sweden, they would have a single auction. I mean, an auction, for, excuse me, of licenses, each of which cover the entire country. Uh, larger countries maybe have more uh, regional divisions, but actually more and more, of course, the, the cell phone providers want to provide national uh, coverage. They want to provide, have a national system. So certainly some of the larger countries in Europe have adopted that procedure of having national licenses. So you don't really need this, the simultaneous aspect. It's true that they are ascending auctions, but they are... Um, uh, they don't have this strong uh, feature, this, this feature making it so much available to create packages of licenses. But in other contexts, uh, I mean, the auctions you want are really quite different. Uh, I mean, you could have posted bids and ask in, a, in markets for financial assets. And I've also worked on uh, auctions for power contracts. And then there again, you use uh, posted bids and, and ask prices. So there's many different formats that are specific to the context. I don't think of a, there being necessarily any national or cultural differences in the sense that probably an auction can, it seems to be can work in any country, any language, any culture. Uh, I've, I've never seen any impediment in, in that way. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, considered, uh, I don't think of any society that considers it to be immoral uh, to participate in an auction. Right, right. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Wilson. So we know that uh, the auction is um, like not only used in the bidding for radio spectrum, but also in terms of oil, uh, in terms of the right for fishing, in terms of uh, uh, mining industry as well. So what are key elements for identifying and analyzing some of those uh, salient issues in auction? Uh, may we invite you uh, to share how you observe a case and further develop a new auction format for it? Well, um... I think it's extremely important to understand the context in great detail. 
So I've worked with particular industries. I mentioned the oil industry and uh, the cell phone industry. And uh, I worked one on auctions for diamonds, that is wholesale markets for diamonds uh, and others, other different ones. Each of these, the important thing is to learn very much how the industry works. What are the um, conventional ways of trading in those uh, in, just, in that industry? You have to understand the technology and the motives, motives of the participants. So usually I, mine's approach tends to grow out of a very detailed understanding of how that industry functions. But it's, it has some sort of standard procedures, a standard understanding and what with the auction design, we're only trying to uh, help them carry out what they've been doing, but just in a somewhat more, more efficient way. Uh, in the case of um, some particular, um, well, just for example, uh, let me take the auction we designed for diamonds that was done with Peter Crampton. So that's very much a consideration that the uh, the participants in the auction don't want to just buy a bag of raw diamonds on the basis of weight. They want to have the diamonds spread out on the table. They want to look at them and look at the varieties and the colors and the, you know all of this in very great detail with very fine microscope. So that kind of informational provision is very important. So, so that would be unique. That would be unique to that industry that the inspection, the very, very detailed inspection of the objects being sold is so important. So um, in terms of other aspects, uh, you know, let's take the spectrum auction, because in that case, we have some licenses that are complements, like Northern and Southern California, but there's some licenses that are substitutes. So there were actually two licenses for Southern California and they are perfect substitutes. So there's a, you have to take account of the fact that in some cases, the complementarities among the items are important. In other cases, it's the substitution among the items. And the auctions can be much more efficient the more substitution there is. The more it is complementarities, you have to have special provi provisions in order to ensure uh, that you're at least approximating an efficient outcome. With pure substitution, you can sort of ensure that you're getting an efficient outcome or a revenue maximizing outcome. But with complements, you cannot assure that and it has to be carefully designed to take account of what complementarities there are. Um, well, I'll leave it at that, but I can, <laughs> the, there are many elaborations that can be made about the considerations that have to be taken into account. Right, thank you very much, Professor Wilson. I think that is very impressive uh, to see how you observe uh, the problem in the reality. Uh, because I think I remember that uh, one of the professor also working uh, in economic, uh, Professor Stephen uh, Zhang Wuchang, uh, who used like to teach uh, economy and uh, always like recommend students uh, the best way uh, to learn economy is go to the market and to observe how like the reality will really working and uh, that could be like uh, to uh, to give you some of the idea and the concept uh, for the economy so i think that is uh, really uh, how i feel that economy is really fascinating so thank you very much for that let me say that the comment you just made is very interesting to me because one of the most influential things that I ever did was to go onto the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So here's two or 300 traders, you know, screaming and shouting and crowding and trying to trade. Of course, nowadays they trade electronically, so you don't see that. But in the old days, they were there in person and they were desperate to try to get to the front and offer their bids to get their bids accepted, to try to negotiate with the brokers. So you, once, once one sees a market like that, the, 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 the human involvement, the turmoil of it, <laughs> you have a strong sense of what the forces are that are driving the market. So anyway, I, I wanted to say, yes, I, I've had 
been in some markets where I've been carried away by seeing uh, actually the behavior that goes on. Right, right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilson. So maybe uh, the last uh, interview question from my side is uh, because in the last year in 2020, uh, I think people in the world uh, is experience uh, the, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19. So how do you see that the auction theory could help for a better allocation of personal protective equipment uh, during the time of crisis? And uh, how do we pursue an efficient way for allocation of resources among the party uh, they participate, if any? Well, so this is, uh, of course, a problem of how to allocate these scarce resources in a crisis. And this is not a time for people to make uh, monopoly profits from having that time, having the scarce resources. So this is really from the from the point of view of public policy um, that we th that we would design the process. So I worked with uh, three of my uh, three co-authors, including Alvin Roth, who who we mentioned, and Peter Crampton, and Axel uh, Oxenfels. So. We, per, and we published this in uh, Science Magazine as a commentary. So um, in the case of uh, personal protective equipment, most of that's allocated by government agencies uh, or those agencies that can direct the way manufacturers allocate those supplies to hospitals or states on the basis of um, the projected demand. So that, that's really a centralized decision and it's a logistics decision of what supplies are available, how to allocate them where demand is expected to be strongest. But there's in the, what actually happens in fact is that those initial allocations are uh, inaccurate compared to the realized uh, demand for those resources. So, uh, what we pointed out was that one can use an artificial money. So let's say a hospital that has surplus PPE can trade it with another hospital that has a shortage. And it can be, that's what it allow this uh, transaction in artificial money, which is used just within these, this uh, allocating system. But it can also be that it depends on different aspects, that it could be that it's gowns one hospital has a surplus of gowns, uh, another has a surplus of masks, others have shortages of these. So we have these different terms. We have, we have masks, we have the face shields, we have the, the gowns, we have the gloves, all these different things. So it's really like, a, almost like you want to have sort of like a supermarket in which the uh, there becomes a, an established price for trading these, these goods just through barter, but we keep track of it through this artificial money of accounts so that, uh, uh, say, if a hospital has given away a lot of its protective equipment, it's getting a credit for it that it can use to buy protective equipment again later uh, as the needs arise. But this is this is purely a speculative system. You understand it was proposed early in the crisis as a proposal. It's not been adopted by, by anywhere. And it was just in the early phases of development. But in some places, uh, something like that is similar to that in some respects is preceded like in Germany where they have a system of allocation, first of all, to the to the to the, the federal government allocates it to the states. The states allocate it to hospitals and other uh, medical facilities. And then there's this system for uh, allowing trade amongst them as the needs arise. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson, for your really impressive uh, feedback uh, for uh, the interview. So with that, I wanted to invite uh, Professor Ben Shen Lin and uh, also. Uh, Robert Zhang uh, to join the discussion and of course uh, Professor He Lianzhen and also Helen. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think that uh, Professor Ben Shenlin uh, prior uh, to join Zhejiang University, 
he was also working uh, for the industry uh, for more than 20 years. So mm -hmm. I think it will be really great uh, to get uh, Professor Ben uh, let your feedback or maybe any question for Professor Robert. Thank you, Long Yi. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, Professor uh, Wilson, I was listening to what you just said about to say auction is uh, applicable across different cultures. You know, it's uh, you know it works in many many other industries as well. I'm just kind of curious about applicability of auction for different industries. We talked about like oil and then say natural resources, oil and mining side, you know, telecom, you know, spectrum, and so on and so forth. And I, as Hongwen Yi mentioned, I was in banking. Mm -hmm. And the banking also <clears throat> has licenses as well. And I was wondering why we don't allow auction to take place for banking licenses, for insurance licenses, because the government indeed could collect some money. And that's one thing. Secondly, I'm just wondering when you did this FCC auction of the spectrum, mm -hmm. was the maximization of revenue the goal for the federal government in the United States? So, well, let me okay. respond first of all to say absolutely the objective was to have an efficient outcome. The maximization of revenue was secondary, but we anticipated that a, an efficient outcome would produce a high revenue because the participants who most value the objects, the licenses should be the ones who are getting them. They're the ones who are winning in an efficient auction and they'll have to pay for them, of course, and they can pay more. So in general, there, there'll be a tendency for revenue, not necessarily be maximized, but to be high. And of course, the experience has certainly shown that all of the spectrum auctions have produced, well, with one or two exceptions, they've produced extremely high revenues. Um, about licenses for things like banking, well, of course, the uh, that's a case of uh, sort of prudential regulation in which, which you want to establish that the institution has the requisite resources and the management arrangements and the accounting procedures and uh, adheres to certain uh, you know, laws and regulations and so on. So that it's not clear at all to me that that could be accomplished with an auction. You understand that, for example, in the case of the spectrum auctions, why, was, why did we actually use spectrum auctions? It's because there has been an administrative process in the United States that allocated spectrum licenses through uh, what we used to call beauty contests, but essentially it's an administrative procedure in which the lobbyists for the companies appear before the commission and plead their case that they should have the license. And then the government agency, in this case, the Federal Communication Commission, just pick the company that it, whose proposal they like the best, and then they award the license. So they sort of give it away to the preferred uh, provider. Well, um, the consequence of that was, first of all, that the companies wasted enormous resources lobbying the commission to try to win a license because here you're winning almost free or essentially entirely free, a license of enormous value. And so you're willing to spend enormous resources on lobbying and influence activities which is all wasted, of course. Uh, secondly, uh, the outcome was extremely inefficient from the point of view of the commission, that the spectrum was allocated slowly, the implementation was slow, and the United States was embarrassed that progress was made in Europe and Asia far faster than the United States. The 1980s was a period of embarrassment that cell phones were available in Europe and not in the United States. In the United States, what was available were these clunky, they're big cell phones. They're, I don't know if anybody remembers those big things. Well, so, I mean, you see them in old movies, in films now. You, I've seen recently one of a film that was from that period. And it, was, it looked ridiculous that they had these big clunky cell phones. 
And the build out was very slow. The firms did not build out their antennas and their systems quickly. Instead, they took years to do it because once they're given this uh, lovely license, uh, they, they weren't driven forward. So what we wanted was something that much that was very, addressed this specific problem, namely, how do you get a faster allocation of the licenses, a faster implementation, and a real commitment of competitive pressures to build out the system and provide service to customers, uh, good service quickly. So that was, and that was very successful to have done it that way. So in that case, an auction was the solution to a problem. So I don't see that there's a problem about allocation of banking licenses <laughs> that's needs, that needs a, a market solution like that. Well, the reason I was asking is because the, you know, if you look at all these things in the different industries, they have different public policy uh, mm -hmm. implications. You know, oil and resources and telecom spectrums and banking and financial services tend to be a bit more like a public good to a certain extent. And there has been enormous, you know, uh, what we call like a Wall Street bashing. I'm sorry, Robert. <laughs> People were saying that they were making too much money and they were doing something that was relatively less related sometimes to the real industry. And you mentioned about the last year, the pandemic has created a situation that the big tech companies, big banks are making loads of money while the rest of the economy were, it was struggling. So, so that's where you know, people say we probably should have a special tax for certain industries which have a public nature of the mm -hmm. services. So that's why I was kind of like uh, asking you know, whether there is some correlation between the public nature of the industry and the auction, for example, banking license, should they pay a special fee to offer the service to the public? Yeah. Well, I don't know enough about the banking industry regulation to say I'd have to know a lot more yeah, but I, I see your point. I mean, you could say, in what sense are oil exploration licenses different from banking licenses? Well, there, there are differences, but we have to spell out what the differences are and why that leads to a different uh, uh, process of allocating those licenses. So it's like I've said earlier, actually, I think it's extremely important to study each industry itself, its specific aspects its unique aspects and build a solution that recognizes those features because you can't just say, well, auctions will solve all kinds of problems, which is really false. There are places where auctions would be inappropriate. Thank you for both uh, Professor Wilson and uh, Professor Ben. So um, Robert, uh, uh, Robert Zhang, uh, let we know that uh, you uh, also uh, doing your career for the financial industry as well. But most interesting, we also found that uh, you did your degree uh, for uh, environmental management from Yale. So I think it will be really interesting uh, to get your perspective, uh, given I think that you have the interdisciplinary background. Thanks, uh, thanks, for, thanks uh, uh, Professor Wilson. Now, uh, actually, my question related to what uh, Professor Ben just said, you know, Wall Street get too much. You know, uh, my understanding about the auction theory is that uh, it is uh, tends to solve uh, problems in the market and try to allocate resources uh, more efficiently. But, uh, you know, since uh, the uh, pandemic started uh, early last year and uh, the whole world have been experiencing a so-called K-shaped recovery, i.e. richer people getting rich, right? And the poor people getting worse. So I think, uh, you know, my understanding is that uh, for most of us all the time, you know, auction theory applies to more industrial specific questions. So I'm wondering if it's possible, you know, to apply auction theory <coughs> to more macro problems i.e. national income redistribution, like, uh, you know, redesign labor negotiation, 
so that middle class people can get a, a, can, can get a bigger part of a national income to show, you know, to, to solve this uh, huge income gap and wealth gap problem in the world. You know, because well, our, you know, we are hedge fund managers, you know, but we are global macro hedge funds. So we look at the world from 2,000 feet above and to look at the fiscal policy and the monetary policy. But the, to me, you know, I'm a quite confusing since the last year. What's up wrong with this problem? Because all these policies, they are making the, this income gap even worse. Well, I'm sympathetic to your concerns, but they're at a they're at a, a so much higher level uh, at the level of uh, public policy and the entire economy. Whereas, uh, you know, what what expertise I bring about auctions is really confined to a much smaller scale, more specific problems. Uh, I don't think of auctions as a as a, a, a you know necessarily useful for any of these things of this kind. So it's really a, addresses a very particular problem of exchange of private goods. So now this may seem strange. I mean, certainly it's true when we look at say the stock market or commodities market, those are private goods and the, they can be exchanged among the parties without external effects on other parties. Uh, so you, it seems strange when we talk about spectrum I mean, clearly these are public goods, the public, in fact, the spectrum is sort of nationally owned. It's a public asset. But of course, the process we're talking about is the allocation of public resources for private uses. So that's why in some ways an auction maybe could be useful because we're, they're competing for uh, licenses for private activity. So where the external effects maybe are small. But when you have externalities and distributional consequences, like you mentioned, I mean, the distributional consequences maybe are poorly handled by an auction. And maybe it has to be supplemented with other kinds of features. It could be taxes or subsidies or preferential treatment or so on. I mean, for even in the spectrum auctions that uh, the ones we were describing, there were special uh, advantages given to businesses owned by minorities women, uh, tribal, the tribal corporations of the United States, uh, each of these groups was, uh, was, uh, had a special, uh, well, first of all, they got a cheaper price. <laughs> they paid 10% less than uh, anybody else, but also they had, there was a, a, a sub auction, it was an initial auction that was confined to participation only by uh, businesses that were owned by minorities and women and, uh, uh, and the tribal corporations. So these are measures that can be undertaken to ameliorate some of the distributional effects. It's certainly true that in general, auctions just do not address distributional aspects or public good externalities uh, directly, those require supplemental treatment that the auction is more basically a means of, of, of trading private goods and without distributional consequences or externalities. So it's a, it should be thought of as a very narrow, limited tool and not one that can address things at the national or global level. Thank you very much for both of you. Oh, before we uh, turn to uh, the question from the audience, um, Professor He, uh, do you have anything you want to add? No, thanks. Okay, no. and uh, Helen? Well, I just wanted to uh, ask if you could, um, Bob, uh, talk a little bit about the winner's curse. This, this I found very fascinating and uh, how uh, one can uh, counter the winner's curse. Well, it's uh, <laughs> sweet that you bring it up, Helen. So, you know, the very first thing I did in auctions clear back in the 19, in 1964 and five. So that's, uh, I mean, that's 56, what is it? No, it's not 60 years, but like 56 years ago, a long time ago. 
was just a study of the winner's curse. So this is one in which there's a common value. Uh, there's a part of whatever they're bidding for that has some uh, that's a it enters everybody's valuation of the item. So if you're talking about a uh, spectrum license, it would be that all of the cell phone companies are concerned about what consumer demand for cell phones will be, or what the market penetration will be. Um, <laughs> I say that, it always amuses me to say something like that because the current market penetration is over 100%. But at the time, they thought it would be it would be extraordinary if it got to be thirty percent. They didn't expect more than thirty percent of the households in America to have a cell phone, <laughs> which seems ridiculous now. But uh, that was the case then. Um, so, um, in the case of oil leases, the the companies are all concerned about how much oil there is under the ground. So that's something they're all trying to estimate. Nobody can observe it directly. They only have estimates based upon seismic tests or gravimetric tests or a certain technique called a sunspot technique. They have a few ways of estimating the, the sort of the probability that there are hydrocarbons in an underground uh, structure. Uh, but that means that the high bidder will be the high bidder, the one who wins the object, will be the one that had the most optimistic estimate. Because the higher their estimate, the higher their bids. The one with the highest estimate will be to have the highest bids, and he'll tend to win, which reveals that his estimate was very biased, that his estimate was at the far extreme high compared to the others, because the others dropped out, and he's the one that won. So that's the, they call that the winner's curse. And, um, that name was actually applied uh, like uh, a decade after my work, and it was based. Of, it was a it was a term that was invented by a man in, named uh, Capon in the oil industry, uh, because they had done these uh, studies trying to explain why profits were so low among the oil companies, and the their explanation was that they were ignoring the winner's curse effect, and people were systematically overestimating. Uh, the value of the tracks they were bidding for. So anyway, that, that's interesting that Helen raises this question because actually that's the earliest and simplest part of the work I ever did, but it's the track part that gets the most interest. <laughs> uh, like when I speak to uh, high school students, uh, which I've done twice now and I'll do some more, that's the thing I talk about because the high school students are really, they think that's that's actually the essence of what auctions is about, is the winner's curse. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson, and also Helen for your question. So mm -hmm. uh, if Professor Wilson, your schedule still allow, uh, may we open uh, just a few questions for the audience? Yes, yes, okay. okay. So uh, Professor Ben, uh, in your venue, uh, do you have anyone uh, want to take this opportunity to raise the question? I would probably suggest that uh, we have Professor Shao Hui, who is uh, my colleague at uh, Zips. Maybe he's online already. Shao Hui, do you have any questions or comments? Oh, yes. It's, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, OK, OK. Uh, so, uh, so Professor Robert Wilson, thank you very much for the opportunity. So my question may be more academic. So this is, what impact does big data now have on traditional auction theory? So as far as I know, generally we have uh, something like first price option, we have second price option, and in this models we have some assumptions. For example, we may assume that the bidder signal to be independent or conditional independent, or sometimes we just assume that they, to be, they are just correlated with some dependent structure. I also remember that in one of your models, you assume that the bidders learn a lower bound on the objects value in advance. So my question is that in the area of big data and machine learning, is there a need for us to rebuild these models or how can we improve these models or how can we improve this assumption in, in the traditional models or, or how can we improve them in, the, in terms of big data or something like machine learning and something like that? So this is my question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, it's certainly true that um, 
uh, big data changes things a lot in terms of sort of uh, how estimates are made and uh, how much you can learn from the transactions you see. And um, the uh, sort of deep learning algorithms have actually had uh, a huge effect on transactions like in financial markets. I mean, actually, um, uh, some of you know about the Renaissance technology. I mean, this is this hedge fund here in the United States that is that makes a 40% rate of return every year. And it does it by just following, tracking all the different, not all, but many, many stocks looking for anomalies in their price patterns. Because there's always, uh, you know, trading variability that will drive a price temporarily up compared to its long-term trend or temporarily down. And if it's Temporarily down, then it's a time to buy and then sell a little later. A very short-term trading strategies like that, which are executed sometimes on the time frame of a second or a millis you know millisecond, even, <laughs> have produced enormous profits for the firms that have done it and that have succeeded at it. Of course, you understand that uh, <laughs> Renaissance Technologies. I have in front of me actually on my screen here, I have uh, up on my browser, uh, this article about Jim, James Simons, the man, the man who did that, the one who implemented that technology and has produced, his income has never been below $2 billion a year for the past, I think it's like 20 years. So, you know, <laughs> but the thing is that uh, this calls for some, Something like that calls for reconsideration of how financial markets work, because now we have venues that are selling access to uh, real-time, you know, just uh, to, to the transaction as fast as possible, so that the people who get that can do front-running of transactions. So you see, I mean, this is transforming how these work. It's completely different than the old days. Like when I started studying financial markets in the 1950s and 60s, there was a specialist and a specialist collected a book of orders and just crossed uh, the transactions that he could, but otherwise had to quote a transaction price because uh, of maintaining a continuous price and had to maintain an order, uh, excuse me, an inventory of money and stock that had to be constantly balanced and of course setting the prices so as to uh, c keep his inventory balanced so he didn't go bankrupt because he ran out of cash or bankrupt because he ran out of stock to trade. Um, so uh, that's a very, by now it seems a, like a primitive form of a double auction for trading financial instruments. Nowadays, we, we realize that there are venues where this sort of the effect of artificial intelligence, uh, you know, deep learning, big data, all that is just completely transforming the way these markets, markets operate. And, and just to take one example, there are these proposals that suggest that we do not have continuous trading. And in fact, the market should clear only periodically. Of course, you might wonder what that period is. You might think it's once once a day or once an hour. No, no, no. <laughs> the proposals are if, if, if they would just clear the market once a second, that would be good enough to make it so that there were not these really short-term effects. So in some of the big markets like the New York Stock Exchange, in, this, in a single second, there's enough accumulation of orders so that you can have a, a, a meaningful uh, price that equates demand and supply. So I would say in the case of financial markets, particularly, it's evident that that these effects that Mr. We, that Professor Wee mentions definitely will, <laughs> are having a big effect and will have even bigger effect in the future. I actually am remembered a story. Um, there's an economist, Shyam Sunder, who about 20 years ago, said, what will it be like when the day comes that the only thing that's preventing arbitrage between the markets in Hong Kong and New York is the speed of light? <laughs> in fact, that day has come. <laughs> so 
you know, the, he was worried at the time, and he was, it seemed like a preposterous idea that we should worry about time being the constraint on arbitrage. And yet the day has come when it's actually true. I hope I addressed your question. Any questions? Anybody who wants to raise a question? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, you have a question. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you can you guys hear me? Hey, you come come here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Professor uh, Robert. Uh, it's my honor, and thanks for having me. Uh, my question uh, related to this uh, this uh, webinar today is: I hear a lot about the options, and I study uh, I study the uh, economics in the states before, and uh, I think it relates a lot like uh, option. And um, recently, uh, Bitcoin is, uh, is is very hot, and I read uh, I read from uh, read Dalio from uh, Bridgewater. And he his uh, his opinion is uh, Bitcoin is is like a long term options with a very risk future, and he would put a little money into it, but he wouldn't mind losing eighty percent of it. And uh, I, I like to um, uh, see what's the uh, insight of uh, uh, Professor Robert uh, about uh, about that. Well, of course, I don't know a thing about Bitcoin. I'm kind of ignorant, so. Uh... But of course, it's always true that, you know, since it's like a currency, every currency is like an option. It's an option, it's an asset that you can hold and then, uh, and then use it later. So you can exercise that option later. So it's a fundamental observation that a currency, even an artificial currency like Bitcoin is a option. It's, uh, it's, not, it's a financial option of course, we sometimes talk about real options. Real options are different than that. It's a real option uh, when you you know actually build something or you know make some physical change. But the uh, financial instruments very often can be modeled best as a uh, financial option. So bit, ordinary puts and calls are financial options, but Bitcoin, being a uh, alternative currency, represents uh, at least one kind of option. It's <laughs> of course, you have, you know it's all dependent upon how you trans how you exchange Bitcoin with other currencies. Okay, so if it's uh, if I'm interested in dollars, <laughs> I'm always interested in the conversion rate between Bitcoin and dollars. I'm not just interested in Bitcoin. So um, basically, my point is, uh, no matter Bitcoin or gold or any currencies or material goods. Uh, in the end, we're, we're going to uh, go back to the fundamental of economics. It's the demand and supply of the of, of these uh, of these goods or financial goods. So, uh, well, yes, from what I, the stories I hear, that's all. That's how what makes Bitcoin work is that uh, supply is limited, and it requires the solution of these difficult mathematical problems that requires great expenditures of energy to produce new coins. So that's a <laughs> definitely a case of supply and demand that, that there's a very limited supply. So if there's a strong demand, then that's is gonna yield a good enough price to make it valuable. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilson and uh, also uh, Professor Ben. I think we have another question from the floor here. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? If you want to come in, we've got the Professor Mike Lee from Zhejiang University, Professor Jing. Hi, uh, my name is Jing Jing, and I'm from Zhejiang University School of Management. I have a question about the climate neutral. And uh, so, how carbon and to be an asset, and there is a carbon market. And what is the option to be used in the carbon? So I didn't understand the first parts of the question. So let's start over again. And there's a carbon market. We have uh, for the manufacturers, they need to buy the carbon emission when they. Oh, you said for carbon. This is uh, permits for carbon emissions. Oh, yes. Very good. 
So, I mean, there, in the United States, we have a market like that for two, not for carbon, but for uh, sulfur dioxides, because that produces acid rain. And we have uh, other sorts of uh, pollutants in the Los Angeles basin that are traded uh, that way. It's, a, of course, a major controversy in, in the world as to whether carbon uh, emissions might be limited either by uh, cap and trade or carbon tax or these different, these are alternative ways of limiting the emission of carbons. So did, did you have a question about like the, the role of like a cap and trade system where, they're, where they do use an auction? Yeah, what is like for the auction? For the carbon uh, carbon market or the carbon trade, because now if they're uh, talking about the carbon tax or the uh, tax and from Europe, Europe, uh, Europe or the from US and like the, for for the international business carbon tax for the international business, then there will be have the question how to price the carbon for the manufacturing the carbon. Oh, I mean, I quite agree that there's uh, the implementation of these diff different things works quite differently. In the case of the carbon tax, I mean, there's this uh, whole process of, uh, of imposing the tax by like a, a government agency and the collection of it and how it's used and its enforcement. And then that affects all kinds of trade relations, like you say, international trading relations. And businesses are very concerned that that will you know, affect their pr the pricings of their products. In the cap and trade system, uh, in some cases, firms prefer that because they buy the permit uh, or else it's allocated on a, it's grandfathered because uh, in the past they've uh, had the, they're given initially permits that are as large as the emissions they've had in the past they've so gradually reduced over time, but initially they start with that. And then when given that permit, they don't have to go through any separate pricing like, a, like you would with a carbon tax. So it doesn't, you, know, you can imagine that if suddenly we started pricing carbon, I don't know, at $100 a ton, there would be these immediate dislocations all through the whole economic system. Whereas if we just allocated to everybody an endowment in carbon emission allowances that's exactly equal to what they did last year, then probably there wouldn't be much dislocation because people would say, well, I could still do what I did last year or I could trade for a little more emissions. So the immediate effects, the immediate dislocations are very small. But then over time, of course, we tighten the system because <laughs> we reduce their allowances. We say 10% of your allowance, or well, I don't, you know, maybe one or two or 3% of your allowances are going to disappear every year. You should realize that we're clamping down and now it becomes much more pressure over time uh, to make the changes to reduce carbon emissions. And this certainly worked in the United States for, uh, sulfur dioxide emissions. I don't have a lot of information about how it's worked in other countries uh, where different kinds of systems, but it's certainly true that the participants in the market liked a cap and trade system better that just because it produced very small dislocations in its initial implementation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, thank you once again for uh, Professor Wilson and also your colleague, Helen, uh, for supporting uh, the webinar. And also really appreciate for Professor He Lianzhen, the Vice President of Zhejiang University for your keeping support uh, to the webinar organized by the Business School, really appreciate. And also uh, Professor Ben and also uh, Robert Zhang and my colleague, uh, Sao Hui. Mm -hmm. And also really appreciate for those of you join us online. Uh, as far as I know uh, from my colleague, today we have uh, together around 16,000 uh, people join us online and also those of uh, people join us offline. So really appreciate for all of you to make this happen. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you.
Thank you very and much. Uh, and just finally, just one thing. Next time we should use auction for, <laughs> for, for <laughs> time. Yeah. And also the last question, okay? <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, Helen, right. Okay. So we'll do that. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay.